Yes, Ms. Gullard. Good morning, sir. Good morning, everybody. Um, these are the submissions on behalf of the Haemophilia Society. They're also um, submissions of a number of people with core cool participant status, represented by my solicitors, Evershed Sutherland. And they include Elizabeth and Jonathan Buggins, and some of you may remember listening to Elizabeth, who was on a panel of parents with infected children. Sharon Lewis, who is the widow of John Prothero, uh, a member of the executive committee in the 1980s. Andrew Martin, Paul Sartain, and David Watters, whose evidence many of you will also remember. He was the general secretary of the society also in the 1980s. Um, I also represent 14 other individuals who would prefer not to be named. I'm going to say a brief something about those, um, some who do wish to be named, um, just so you understand where they're coming from. Elizabeth Buggins, the mother of four children, one of them, Jonathan, three sons and a daughter. Her three sons were all diagnosed with severe haemophilia A in the late 1970s and early 1980s, and their care took place at Birmingham Children's Hospital under uh, then Dr. Frank Hill. Elizabeth discovered that two of her three sons, Richard and Jonathan, were infected with HIV when she saw a list of names on the hospital fridge. As she says in her statement, uh, Dr. Hill, and this is a quote, was concerned that our knowing of a positive diagnosis would change our relationship with our child. There was no treatment and nothing could be done about the results. That was the attitude. Her son Richard died in 1986 at the age of eight and she gave evidence in October last year on the panel that I just mentioned. Her son Jonathan has made a statement to the inquiry not yet disclosed. His elder brother was Richard, the one who died in 1986. And Jonathan's statement addresses the impact of his treatment at the Birmingham Children's Hospital and of being infected. When he was 12, his parents brought a medical negligence compensation claim on his behalf, which was settled at trial shortly before Dr. Hill was due to give evidence when Dr. Hill's employer offered 75,000 pounds, which sum was accepted. And in his statement, John gives important views on litigation, how he feels it does not improve patient safety and it enables organizations and individuals to hide, escape their responsibility and obstruct the search for the truth. Sharon Lewis, John Prothero's widow, has made a statement which has also not yet been disclosed um, when it is, I very much recommend reading it. It's WITN 3107001. John Prothero, her husband, died from the consequences of an HIV-related infection on the 19th of October 1989, when he was 45 years old. He was the Society's treasurer and a board member, and she says in her statement that during the course of John's life, he campaigned for the interests of people with haemophilia to be advanced in terms of achieving access to justice, acknowledgement of their situation, and also recompense in relation to the consequences that have befallen the haemophilia community. Andrew Martin has made a statement which is um, disclosed and not quite yet on the website. He has haemophilia A was diagnosed with hepatitis C at some point in or around 1993. And he says, when I was diagnosed with hepatitis C, my mother was very quick to say that it was her belief that no doctor would ever do anything that would be detrimental to my health. And it has been a shock to discover that we were not being protected or at least provided with the information that the government or clinicians knew. Paul Sartain has made a statement which is available on the website. He was diagnosed with severe haemophilia A in 1970 and affected with hepatitis B and C. And he says, in my view, my parents and or I did not think to ask about risks because my treatment, 
cryoprecipitate or factorate was to ease the pain and suffering from a bleed. Many times as a young child, I would have countless nights of disturbed sleep, pray for the pain to go away and or violently shake my head until I was so dizzy and feeling nauseous that I'd slump back onto my bed in a state of stupor. And lastly, something about David Waters. He was the coordinator and general secretary between 1981 and 1994. He's made a statement which is available and he gave evidence on the 10th, 11th of 12th of February, 1921. David says his heart aches for victims of infected blood and he said he won't ever forget the good friends on the executive committee and throughout the society who I lost through HIV and AIDS and who I remember with affection. The society asks the inquiry to find that it and its members were fortunate to have the services of Mr. Waters. Prior to joining the society, he was a social worker. He worked particularly with homeless people. And after leaving the society, which he did not want to do, he worked for another healthcare related charity. His motivation throughout his professional life was to improve the lives of others less fortunate than himself and he worked tirelessly in pursuit of that goal. He advocated for people with haemophilia at benefit tribunals. He campaigned for financial relief for those infected with HIV. He was there at the start of the campaigns for hepatitis C compensation, and he was a gifted administrator. He and the Reverend Tanner were patently good men, doing the best they could for the entire bleeding disorder community in close to impossible circumstances. And you will all know that the Reverend Tanner's son, Mark, died of infected blood-related um, illnesses and was ill throughout much of the time that the Rev Tanner was chair of the society. Those are the pen portraits. I now want to quote from two reports. The first quotation is the same one that Mr. Snowden gave you on Tuesday from the Bishop Jones November 2017 report on Hillsborough. That was the crush at a football stadium in April 1989, which caused almost 100 deaths. And Mr. Snowden quoted that part of the report where the bishop explained how he came by the phrase, the patronizing disposition of unaccountable power and talked about the experience of the Hillsborough families when in all innocence and with a good conscience they asked questions of those in authority on behalf of those they loved and found the institutions closing ranks. He went on to say this, and so the Hillsborough family's struggle to gain justice for the 96 has a vicarious quality to it so that whatever they can achieve in calling to account those in authority is of value to the whole nation. The concerns that it deals with are both historic and contemporary. That applies just as much to all of you. Everything that you've done has had the same vicarious quality to it, and everything that you have done will be of benefit to the nation. The concerns of this inquiry go further back even than the events of Hillsborough, and as yesterday's submissions on behalf of the DHSC, which I'll return in a moment, amply demonstrate, they are not only contemporary, but pressing. The second quotation is from Baroness Cumberledge's report, First Do No Harm, and that was published midway through this inquiry in July 2020. Some of the matters into which her review inquired dated back to 1950, very similar to this inquiry. The passage of time and the fact that attitudes, cultures, communication and so on have changed over the decades did not prevent the Baroness from getting to the heart of the matter and they won't stand in your way, sir, either. Much of the evidence of this inquiry corroborates her conclusion. <clears throat> and this is what she said. We have found that the healthcare system, in which I include the NHS, private providers, the regulators, 
and professional bodies, pharmaceutical and device manufacturers and policy makers is disjointed, siloed, unresponsive and defensive. It doesn't adequately recognise that patients are its raison d'etre. It's failed to listen to their concerns. And when belatedly it's decided to act, it has too often moved glacially. Indeed, over these two years, we have found ourselves in the position of recommending, encouraging and urging the system to take action that should have been taken long ago. The system is not good enough at spotting trends in practice and outcomes that give rise to safety concerns. Listening to patients is pivotal to that. It all sounds horribly familiar. Um, first Do No Harm is a document which I will come back to if I have time. So I'd like to put it on screen so that those of you who are understandably not familiar with it can see the similarities here. Thank you, Lawrence. You're ahead of me, which is great. Um, page, we've got paragraphs 1.1 to 1.3, and those are on internal page 0009 that looks like 18 that's it it's really close um, type. If, I don't know if we can enlarge 1.2. Very briefly, so that it makes sense, this is um, <clears throat> what she was looking at. Hormone pregnancy tests, um, which were taken off the market in the late 1970s, thought to be associated with birth defects and miscarriages. Sodium valproate, which is an anti-epileptic, which causes physical malformations, autism, and developmental delay in children when taken by their mothers in pregnancy, and pelvic mesh implants used in surgical repair of organ prolapse and to manage urinary incontinence, linked to crippling, life-changing complications. And then if we look at page 0011, She identified right at the bottom 16 common and compelling themes which chime very much with your experiences. Number one, the lack of information to make informed choices. And then over the page. Lack of awareness of who to complain to and how to report adverse events. The struggle to be heard, not being believed dismissive and unhelpful attitudes on the part of some clinicians, a sense of abandonment, life-changing consequences, not only for those directly affected, but their families and friends, breakdown of family life, loss of jobs, financial support, sometimes housing, loss of identity and self-worth, a persistent feeling of guilt, children becoming their mothers and siblings' carers, we might say fathers, husbands, brothers. Clinicians untutored in the skills they need to make a proper diagnosis. Clinicians not knowing how to learn from patients. Inaccurate or altered patient records. A lack of interest in and an inability to deliver the monitoring of adverse outcomes and long-term follow-up across the healthcare system. All of that will be horribly familiar to all of you. Thank you, Lawrence. You could take that down. To that list... I would add two things. The first and lesser is the indignity, harshness and hostile nature of the so-called support schemes. The other more important matter is death and bereavement. There are no words that can truly capture the depth and intensity of suffering that you have recounted to us. Some witnesses may have found making statements or giving oral evidence cathartic but for others, it's been traumatic. They've been through so much, and everybody at the society is humbled and deeply grateful to them for suffering further through telling us about it. Doctors really struggle to talk to patients about risk in a way that gives patients the information that they need 
and enables everyone to make the choice that is right for them as an individual. Informed choice is the heart of what went wrong over and over again. Safe treatment was taken away by the government so that it was not an available choice. Or doctors consciously or unconsciously took that choice away because they acted without thinking or thought they knew best. There can be no more compelling teaching tool than the first-hand accounts of what infected blood has done to you and that you have provided to us selflessly by giving us the evidence that you have done and allowing it to be captured on camera. Thank you. Thank you too to the inquiry. The kindness, calm and consistency of the front of house staff, their regular meetings around the country, the absolute professionalism of the legal team. We know this more than you do because we lawyers watch other lawyers, but it really has been the best of the best. And the technical teams. So Brian, your attention to detail and your very personal involvement have been notable features every single day of this long running inquiry. If the culture that your vision for your inquiry has created could be exported into the NHS and government more widely, that would be grounds for hope for a state that is more listening, compassionate and responsive to the needs of those it is here to serve. Which <clears throat> brings me to yesterday. <laughs> We're all familiar with the phrase, actions speak louder than words. Yesterday, we got no actions and no words. But more precisely, we got a lot of words that said nothing at all. The first thing to say is that none of that is the fault of Miss Gray, King's Council, or her team. I have no reason to doubt, and I think you should not either, that she and her team have worked hard and to a very high standard to further the work of the inquiry and provide statements and submissions that so far as can be seen from the outside are clear, thorough and meticulously researched and referenced. Miss Gray said as little as she did because her client, the Department of Health and Social Care, provided her with nothing more that she could say. The fault and the responsibility lies not just with the department she represented, but the whole of the cabinet from the Prime Minister down. When we were informed at the end of the day on Tuesday that the department submissions would not start at 10 o'clock as timetable, but instead at two o'clock and be over by three o'clock, there were a lot of questions about what that might mean. There was, within the society, a degree of expectations that the submissions were going to be short because the government had something of substance to announce. Instead, time that could have been put to good use by infected and affected core participants was wasted. In September 2018, Ms Gray informed the inquiry that the department accepted that things happened that should not have happened and that it was sorry. Yesterday, she delivered the astonishing news that after a four-year opportunity to reflect on those things that should not have happened, the department had somehow gone backwards and is now unable to identify what it was sorry for when the inquiry started. There's been some sort of groupthink amnesia. Ms Gray referred to the fact that on the 15th of December, the Cabinet Secretary told the House of Commons that the government accepted moral responsibility for infected blood, but yesterday it was unable to say through its lawyers why it has accepted moral responsibility or what that actually means. My clients accept that they cannot force the department to say what it is sorry for. Sir Brian had a go, and if he can't make that happen, then neither can we. But the cowardly approach taken by the department has three consequences. First, what little trust there might have been has gone. Second, and this was not the society's position before yesterday afternoon, it now joins with the submissions of Mr. Snowden, um, King's Council, 
on behalf of those represented by Collins, that there needs to be further interim recommendations on compensation for parents, children and grandchildren who have been bereaved by infected blood. The payments of £100,000 were only made because Sir Brian you made an interim recommendation in that regard. Bereaved people have had nothing and they deserve something now. There is no reason to believe that the government will do anything without a recommendation from you. Third, it is absolutely imperative now that this inquiry does not end with the publication of the report. For as long as your inquiry is alive, Sir Brian, people have trust and hope that there will be accountability, compensation and lasting change. The fear is that as soon as you close this inquiry, there may be delay, backsliding and nothing will really change. We would not see your report want to be as widely disregarded as it would appear um, the Bishop Jones' report into Hillsborough has been. Yesterday rather proved that that fear may be well founded. A way must be found to hold the government's feet to the fire after the report is published. Ms Gray mentioned Mr Quinn's statement in the House of Commons on the 15th of December. We would mention the debate um, in the House of Lords on the 20th of December uh, last year, five days later. I've given the reference to Ms Richards and um, we'll make that reference available to you, Sir Brian. There's a transcript of the debate on the theyworkforyou.com website, which you may be interested to read. Baroness Neville Rolfe, who uh, is the Minister for the Government in the House of Lords, said that Ms Sue Gray at the Cabinet Office is bringing together permanent secretaries from the Treasury, HMRC, the Cabinet Office, DHSC, the DWP, the DLUHC, I think that's the levelling up one, the devolved nations and others. She told the House of Lords that this group met monthly and that, this is a quote, it is gearing up, thinking about the IT systems and how we ensure that we contact people who might want to seek compensation once we know the precise framework and make sure that everyone can respond. Publicity is very important with these public issues and noble lords across the House can help with that so that people know what is happening, end of quote. She then said that careful consideration was being given as to whether there should be an arm's length body. She said the government would want to work with, quote, people affected, unquote, and acknowledged the work of the APPG. She said she'd make progress statements to the House. On the 11th of January this year, in a written answer to a parliamentary question, Mr Quinn said that the cross-government working group was taking forward work on the establishment of an arm's length body. The Society makes three points. The first is about the need for the working group to listen to infected and affected people's views on the compensation framework they want and need now, not when the finished product is delivered. Returning briefly, to the government's implementation of the Cumberledge Review's recommendations. The Society notes, and it's one of my New Year's resolutions to stop bombarding Miss Richards with emails telling her to listen to Woman's Hour. <laughs> that she gave an interview um, to BBC. We, there was an interview on, on Woman's Hour on the 3rd of January 2023 given by the Patient Safety Commissioner. That was a recommendation of Baroness Cumberledge's report and Dr Henrietta Hughes has been in post for some months now. Dr Hughes talked about the mesh removal centres which have been set up in response to the Cumberledge Review's findings. And Dr Hughes told the BBC that these centres are not meeting the needs of users because when the clinics and systems were designed, the views of the women harmed by mesh were not listened to. The society is concerned that the same error may be being repeated right now in relation to the working group setting up the infected blood compensation framework. Second, transparency. The society would suggest, and Sir Brian, we might like to tempt you into considering an interim recommendation, that it is reasonable to ask that we have published, one, the names and members of the working group, two, the dates of their meetings and the agenda and minutes, 
and three, that there are regular publicly available written progress reports. Infected and affected people shouldn't have to scour the internet looking for reports of debates in the House of Lords to find out what is going on. And if the working group wanted to report, they could do so to this inquiry and keep this inquiry in the loop, not just make statements in the House of Lords. Third, just going back to that quote um, about what the working group is currently doing, thinking about the IT systems and how we ensure that we contact people, it's hard to know where to start. Shout out um, to Baroness Neville Rolfe and her colleagues, come on down to Waldwich House. People here are very nice. They don't bite and you can talk to them and you can listen to them and you can find out what they need. And there are a whole load of people sitting behind me who could probably give you the list of people to contact right here and right now. You really don't need to ask members of the House of Lords to do your publicity work for you. It's all here, handed on a plate, if you would only like to come and listen. There's still time. You've had a long time to think about what you want and what you need from a compensation framework. You should be in the tent, not outside it. I'm going to turn now to the past. These submissions look at the past, the present and the future. They're focused on the future because that's where the society can make a positive difference for people who are suffering now and for future generations of people with a bleeding disorder. In not touching on the past at greater length, the society isn't seeking to evade scrutiny. And we have tried to explain its knowledge of risk and its actions, particularly in the 1980s, as thoroughly as possible in written submissions. We've asked the questions, why did the society support the importation of into the UK of US blood products that it knew carried a higher hepatitis risk than UK treatment before the UK had achieved self-sufficiency? From 83 to 85, why did it tell its members that the risk of being treated with US products and getting AIDS was outweighed by the risk of not being treated at all? And why did it press the government to continue importing US products that it knew could be contaminated with AIDS, even when it was known that AIDS was a killer disease for which there was no cure? Before I look at those, a word about money um, and the cost of haemophilia. I'm going to quote from a document that's on the website, which is a collection of pieces from the British Medical Journal. Um, and I give a trigger warning that it contains language and an ethical stance which may be offensive. It goes without saying that the society wants to make it very clear that it's not its position that anyone in government or the NHS intended the death of any patient or section of the public. Um, but, but this is an important part of the context um, of, of the lives of people with haemophilia at the beginning of the 1970s. Uh, the society was always mindful that if NHS money was going to be spent on haemophilia treatment, the government would want to see that justified financially, but there was actually more at stake. In 1971, the BMJ published a profile opinion piece that had coverage in the national press, arguing that the successful treatment of haemophilia, especially for severe cases, was enabling not only the survival of these high demand patients, but also their likelihood of having children. And this is the quote, if we continue the policy of treating such sufferers with the full resources of modern medicine, we shall spend a steadily increasing proportion of the national income for their benefit and reduce the proportion available for the care of other forms of illness, education, technical development, and so on. Are we prepared to pay such a price and increase the number of biochemical cripples fourfold in a generation? Is not this too high a price to pay for our comfortable glow of companionable humanity? Later correspondence in the BMJ was consistently critical of that stance, and there was never any further discussion of eugenics with regard to haemophilia. But the cost of people keeping people with haemophilia alive has never gone away. 
One thinks, for example, of the Society's campaign for recombinant for all in the late 1990s and the fight to get that extended from children to adults. And the restricted access on cost ground to Harvoni, for example, that was still taking place as late as 2016, the year before this inquiry was announced. When preparing for the Archer inquiry, one of the documents that the Department of Health was concerned might cause some embarrassment was a March 1995 document. And that was a memo that said, steps to prevent the remainder of the haemophiliac population becoming seropositive are likely to have a strong cost benefit plus in terms of lives saved. Of course, the maintenance of the life of a haemophiliac is itself expensive. And I'm very much afraid that those who are already doomed will generate savings which more than cover the cost of testing blood donations. A few points may be made. First, and most obviously, the fact that lives of people with haemophilia is expensive is not the fault of haemophiliacs. People with rare diseases exist in every population, and in countries with a developed healthcare system, part of the duty of government is to protect them as much as everybody else. Second, freeze-dried large pool concentrates were welcomed, partly because they were seen as an improved means of enabling the bleeding disorder community to make a financial contribution. In 1979, the Department of Health and Social Services sponsored a study into home treatment and found that it, quote, provided savings in time lost from school and work, a greater sense of security and increased capacity for planning ahead. In 1989, the Reverend Tanner wrote to Norman Lamont, seeking more financial support for people with haemophilia infected with AIDS, and explained that, quote, they became infected through their use of prescribed medication in an earnest desire to maintain their health and play an active role in society. Third, the maintenance of the lives of people with haemophilia would have been less expensive if self-sufficiency had been achieved by 1997, as Dr. Owen and the Medical Research Council said it would have been. As doctors frequently pointed out to government, if it stopped paying a lot of money for expensive commercial blood products to US pharma, it would recoup the capital cost of rebuilding BPL in a relatively short period of time. Fourth, had there been better cooperation between the British and Scottish blood services and any governmental drive to use the fractionation capacity of Liberton, again, the lives of people with haemophilia would have been less expensive. And fifth, a person born with haemophilia doesn't come with a set price tag attached. It was within government's power to control the amount of taxpayers' money spent on them. As other core participants have pointed out, government could have limited the amount of money regions were allowed to spend on factor eight, or made a decision not to fund prophylaxis, or to limit home treatment, and it was government's choice to move away from cryo and move on to large pool concentrates. So in 1979, we have the Department of Health commissioning a study to look at the financial contribution people with haemophilia could make by using home treatment, working, and contributing to the economy. And six years later, in 1985, the department was taking into account the contribution they would make to the cost of testing for AIDS by dying of AIDS. People with haemophilia were vulnerable physically and psychologically. They grew up knowing that they were expensive to treat. Some of them had had shortages of treatment or rationing. They were deeply grateful for cryo and the knowledge that their children were not going to die in their 20s but live a long life. And they were grateful again for concentrate and home treatment. They were dependent on other people's willingness to give blood, on taxpayers, on continued government funding of the treatment that kept them alive and healthy. And from 1973, many of them were made dependent on US commercial pharmaceutical companies. Above all, they were dependent on their doctors whom they trusted to act in their best interests in the same way that the society trusted Professor Arthur Bloom and other members of its advisory panel. These were not relationships between equals, and all of these factors are the context for the decisions made by the society. The next point is government responsibility. 
it's government's responsibility to consult with a section of the population, such as those with a bleeding disorder and any charity that advocates for their rights. But decisions about how to allocate resources are for government, not for patients and not for little charities that represent patients. What medicines should be licensed for use in the NHS? Whether they should be manufactured by the NHS or private companies? Whether those companies should be based in the UK or abroad? How much treatment is made available to which patients and where? These are decisions for government and for the NHS, not for patients. And that was particularly the case in relation to the funding of haemophilia care in the 60s, 70s and 80s, where there was a distinct power imbalance and a patient dependency and vulnerability. The duty of advising patients about whether they needed a treatment with a blood or a blood product, what the choices were, what the treatment recommendation was and why, the risks and benefits, that was the duty of doctors. It was not the duty of the society. So why did the society support the switch from cryo to concentrate and support importation of US products? Very simply, cryo gave you a long life. Concentrate allowed you to live your life to the full. What home treatment took away, and it's probably not possible for those of us who don't have a bleeding disorder to understand this, was the pain of an untreated bleed, the fear of pain, and the spectre of bleed-induced permanent disability. In January 1972, the Society republished an editorial from The Practitioner, a journal which is primarily aimed at GPs, which tells you something about how widespread was the state of knowledge at that time. And the editorial talked the reader through the work of J. Garrett Allen in 1970, which identified the fact that commercial blood is riskier than voluntary blood. And the piece in the bulletin explained why. Paid blood came from prisoners, people on skid row, people addicted to drugs and alcohol. So the society knew that in 1972, before the first US products were licensed in 1973, and it made that knowledge available to anyone who read the bulletin. At the time, the NHS wasn't producing enough cryoprecipitate or concentrate to meet the needs of patients, and that was a concern to the society. The society didn't particularly mind what form the treatment took, so long as there was enough of it to go round, and it did whatever it could to plug gaps in the NHS provision. Uh, there's a report in a 1974 bulletin of the society offering a hospital assistance with volunteer workers to help increase production of cryo, and the response from the hospital was that that help might be resented by technical staff and could result in industrial action. If you read the bulletins of the time, there are a host of examples, and we've given them in our written submissions, of what the society was doing to try to make treatment available to people across the country, um, providing home freezers and all sorts of things like that. In 1974, Dr Biggs published a, a letter in the Lancet, saying that there was a shortage of treatment and that 90% of UK patients were getting less than the optimum treatment for their complaint. Non-urgent operations were being cancelled and there was a delay in putting patients on home treatment. In that context, the society supported an increase in the supply of concentrate, but there's no evidence that it campaigned for licenses to be issued so that blood products could be imported from America. The minutes of the meetings of the centre directors in October 72 and January 74 record that it was the centre directors who were pressing for permission to do that, and that given the choice, none of the centre directors preferred to use cryoprecipitate, they all preferred to use concentrate, factor eight. It was David Owen, who was the health minister when American blood products were licensed for use in the NHS in 73. As he explains in his witness statement, he knew what he was doing. He had reviewed Titmus' book for the New Statesman in 1971, and he identified in his review the fact that there was no moral, financial, or administrative case for using US products in the NHS. 
he knew the risks to the bleeding disorder community that he was sanctioning. This was a stopgap measure, and when he made it possible for US blood products to come into the country in 73, he committed the government to self-sufficiency by 1977. That was the aim. The problem was that the aim wasn't achieved, and there was never a plan B. The society was concerned at the time that that date was going to be missed. It spoke to Dr. Owen at the end of 1975, talked to him about what could be done, about plasmapheresis, the regional structure of BTS, and other matters, and repeatedly expressed its concern about increasing reliance on US commercial concentrates, but nothing changed. In his letter to the Archer Inquiry in August 2007, Chris James, the Society's chief executive at the time, summarised the efforts that the UK HCDO went to in 1977, 78 and 1980. That's ARCH 00001014. So in all of those years, the UK HCDO was trying to impress on government that it needed to hurry up with self-sufficiency with the same lack of success. So in the early 70s, there might have been some knowledge amongst some members of the bleeding disorder community that large pool concentrates had an increased hepatitis risk and that US products were worse than NHS ones. But what you know and what you really get and understand are two different things, and the World in Action documentaries were eye-opening. So this is a good point to replay part of the second documentary broadcast in December 1975, where patients, parents, and the Society's Executive Committee were asked for their reactions to the first broadcast, which showed how blood was collected in the US on Skid Row and the added risks of products. Take it away, please, Lawrence. To stop internal bleeding and crippling, Haemophiliacs can be treated with a British Factor 8 product called cryoprecipitate, but this may mean a hospital visit. More conveniently, they can treat themselves at home with a special concentrated Factor 8 product like the American Haemophil. Many prefer this, it's easier and treats bleeding without delay. Britain does produce some Factor 8 concentrate, but most is imported and comes from paid donors. In the last 18 months, imported haemophil has been linked with an unprecedented outbreak of hepatitis among Britain's 3,000 haemophiliacs. Tonight, World in Action investigates why Britain has had to import high-risk concentrates and how much it has cost. First, we went back to Newcastle to the families in last week's film. All three attend a haemophilia centre at this hospital where the doctor in charge treats many of his patients with haemophil. One, Keith Proud, caught hepatitis while using haemophil. Had he been put off? The only time that I felt that I was wondering about whether it was worth it was when I was vomiting really badly. But two days later, I had a bleeding in my elbow, and I had no hesitation in going to the fridge, getting the haemophil out, mixing it, and injecting it, because I knew that would stop the bleed. And the pain from that bleed was going to be so much worse than any of the pain I'd suffered with hepatitis. As much as I feel that uh, Keith was really ill when he had hepatitis, he suffered far more when, he was, when there was nothing at all. And they are progressing. Would you prefer a National Health Service concentrate made from voluntary blood donors in Britain? Obviously, this, this would be better. Uh, Obviously, if it's donated uh, freely, there is less chance of people passing on hepatitis. People that are donating it are uh, less risk value. But until that is available, we uh, have to accept the risks. The second family we visited last week was the Atkinsons. Their son, Andrew, uses haemophil. What do you feel about the type of donors who are selling their plasma for haemophil? This is something we knew. Well, not exactly knew. We, we had, it had been explained to us before. And uh, 
they are people who are prepared to give the blood and we are people looking for the, those people we want the the, uh, the factor aid from them would you prefer a national health service concentrate made from safer voluntary donors in Britain we wouldn't it's, we, we think yes it would be much better but uh, at the moment well do you think they would be able to get enough blood from voluntary sources we doubt this very much at the moment but we would like to see it very much Next, we visited the Robinson family. Neil has been on home treatment with haemophil for the last two years. We know the risks that we have to take with our children. We don't gamble with their lives, but we do take a calculated risk. Haemophil is one of the calculated risks. We know what it's done for us. And only people who live with haemophilia know what it's like. But what is your reaction to the type of people who are selling plasma to make haemophil? Shouldn't be allowed to. It is very bad. It's it's we don't want it. But what other alternative have we got? For two years, Neil has lived a normal life through haemophil. We don't like the, the idea of these down and outs, skid road tight, what have you. Give them this blood. No, but Britain could cut the risks down. Britain could cut the risks down. By making their own. Well, they are. They're 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 they are. They can make their own. They can make all of it. And then the risks would be considerably less. How strongly do you feel that the National Health Service should produce a British safer product? Well, after your last programme, very, very strongly. We would like to see this happen. We prefer British. We know that British is pure, or purer than the American. There's less chance of better contact and hepatitis through with the British product. We only hope that the British government and the National Health Service will sit up and take notice of this and do something about it. Well, in the state of the country now, they can produce it a lot cheaper than what they can buy it from America. And why British pioneer work did not ensure enough of a safer British-made concentrate. World in Action asked the Executive Committee of the Haemophilia Society, a pressure group for haemophiliacs, to watch our report. The Society has been campaigning for more commercial concentrates. After the programme, they discussed their reactions. If we accept, and I think most of us do, that we would prefer to see all the material coming from production in this country through the blood transfusion and the, and yeah. the health service, I just, if the Department of Health or whoever is responsible don't do something constructive about improving supplies in this country, the logical step is going to be commercial production in this country, eventually. Yeah. And if the, the dangers in the States are repeated here, we could be in trouble. Yeah, but we understand, don't we, that uh, there's not a shortage of donors as such, it's just a shortage of the uh, facilities to make the uh, concentrate. But do we? We're always well, being told something yeah. different. We're being told there's a shortage of donors, there's a shortage of equipment, there's a shortage of money. What is the shortage? We never seem to get any nearer to the answer. We've been, for the last 10 years, we're being told there's a shortage and everything will be all right in five years' time. But nothing ever changes, probably because of the increased demand. But what is the sh shortage? Nobody ever really puts their finger on it. I think most of us would prefer deep down to be using National Health Service mm -hmm. and blood transfusion products. But I feel very uneasy about commercial concentrates and after seeing this program I should think a lot of other people would be even more uneasy. I must admit one of the, the things that disturbed me rather was to see the pictures of Skid Row which seems a bit at variance with the assurances that the commercial companies have given us. Um, you know they're not using this sort of blood for factor eight. Uh, I'm wondering whether in fact the uh, the other companies are using the same sort of blood. Uh, I, I had a talk at, uh, in August with one of the certain others, as they put it in the programme, um, who said, we're not using that sort of blood at all for our factor eight production. Well, is that just Highland? Is that, in fact, representative of all the other commercial companies? Or is that just part of Highland's production and is, in fact, haemophil made from other blood? It, it's something we'll still have to look at. Because, as I say, it doesn't really seem to gel with what we've been told. So. One of the things I noticed on that programme was the, 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 the sort of ethical...
problems and social problems which, uh, which it posed, and that is the question of whether people, the less fortunate people should be used or uh, used as donors, whether we should take blood from them, whether commercial firms should take blood from them. Well, I'm quite sure that the answer for the haemophiliac in this country would be he's not really too bothered about where the blood comes from as long as he's got that blood concentrate to keep him going and in some cases to keep him alive. No doubt whatsoever in my mind. Of course, equally well, he'd much sooner if there were a sufficient number of uh, well-disposed people, and there are thousands upon thousands of them already in this country, who would come along and regularly give blood and who weren't undernourished, who weren't alcoholics, who weren't drug, drug addicts. I'm sure that they would be delighted. If there were sufficient uh, blood donors coming along, as you say, would the National Health Service have the facilities to be able to produce the concentrate from it? Mm. And if, uh, we don't know that they have the facilities. And in fact, we, you know, when we do inquire about this, they say, yes, they have. Well, if so... Why aren't we getting the concentrate from this country? If there's sufficient donors, why aren't we getting the concentrate? So I see the time, and I'm told that cometh the time, cometh the Paddington hard stairs from the bench. Um, so I don't know if this is marmalade sandwich time um, or not. Well, I think it might be a bit early. Uh, if, if there are, uh, let's say, a, a few more minutes that you can... Uh, take us up to, say, quarter past 11. Yes, with pleasure. Well, that was December 1975. Um, probably, one imagines, filmed not long before the Society had its meeting with David Owen and talked to him about plasmapheresis and other things that could speed up production in this country. I want to fast forward, um, if you'll come with me, to 1983 and the Society's May advice. Despite its contacts with civil servants and the doctors on its medical advisory panel, when it came to the two infections that destroyed so many lives, including the lives of many of those who you've been just seen talking, the Society had just as few facts and as little reliable information about risk as any patient with haemophilia. The inquiry has produced an impeccable chronology of the knowledge of risk. When it comes to what the society knew, it's as important to look at what it didn't know but could have been told as to what it did know. The society trusted people with knowledge in the NHS and in the civil service to share what they knew in the way that the society shared what it knew with those people but this was not an information two-way street. In January 1983, Professor Bloom attended a hepatitis working party meeting where Dr. Krask talked about the information he had had from the CDC in America. At that time, there were 10 cases of AIDS in haemophilia A patients in the States, and it seemed to the CDC possible that factor eight or other blood products might be implicated. That was in January. On the 7th of March, 1983, Dr. Evert at the CDC in the States wrote to Professor Bloom. And he said this, as you can imagine, I think you have to try to imagine an American accent, which I won't do, but you know, take yourself back to Atlanta. AIDS is having a major impact on the treatment of haemophiliacs here presently. The evolution of the epidemic is occurring with a frightening pace. We presently have 13 confirmed haemophiliac patients with AIDS in the United States. One of the patients has a factor IX deficiency, one is bisexual. In addition, five more highly suspect cases are under investigation. The incidence rate has been increasing in haemophiliacs and the epidemic curve parlays that of the total epidemic curve. The first case appeared in a haemophiliac in January 1982. A total of nine were reported by December. Of those, eight died in 1982. I suspect it's a matter of time before you begin to see cases in the United Kingdom. It is truly shocking to read that letter alongside Professor Bloom's advice to the Society and its members two months later. It's clear from all of his actions 
that Dev Dr. Everett wanted the facts about AIDS and the threat of AIDS to people with haemophilia to be widely known. He was doing everything he could to get the word out. This was not, in any sense, a confidential letter. Professor Bloom could and should have shared it with the society. As Mr Snowden pointed out on Tuesday, 10 days after the date of that letter, on the 17th of March 1983, Professor Bloom diagnosed AIDS in his own patient with haemophilia, Kevin Slater. And it was less than two months later that he gave advice to the society and its members that, quote, the cause of AIDS is quite unknown and it has not been proven to result from transmission of a specific infected agent in blood products. The number of cases reported in American haemophiliacs is small, and in spite of inaccurate statements in the press, we are unaware of any proven case in our own haemophilic population. The Society will never know why Professor Bloom did not share with it the letter he received from Dr. Everett in March with its devastating and accurate warning that the epidemic of AIDS amongst people with haemophilia in the US was likely to cross the Atlantic and arrive in the UK. It will never know why he chose consistently to minimise the risk of AIDS. Before this inquiry, the Society did not know the extent of his breach of the trust it put in him, and the distress has been considerable. The Society trusted the doctors providing it with advice to inform them of the facts and not withhold them even if the facts were difficult to hear. It particularly trusted Professor Bloom, who was not only the UKHCDO chair, but a trusted advisor to government at a high level. He abused the society's trust. Other doctors have told the inquiry that there was a lot of confusion. There were lots of conflicting theories. Things that now seem clear were not clear then. But facts are facts, and Dr. Krask and Professor Bloom had the facts about what was happening in the States and the CDC's working approach to a likely epidemic. As you said, Sir Brian, during the presentation on knowledge of risk, the numbers were going up. The society and people with haemophilia were entitled to know what the numbers were. As a follow-up to its Killer Blood article, um, in the first weekend in May 1983. The Mail on Sunday published a further article called Action to Ban Danger Blood. And that reported a doctor pinching as saying that, and I quote, I wouldn't dream of giving a patient American blood products. We have to find an alternative immediately. It seems likely, and we invite you to find, sir, that it was because of that quote in the national press that the society either invited Dr. Pinching to write for the bulletin, or he said to the society he would like to write something for them. Dr. Pinching did not treat people with haemophilia, and he wasn't a centre director. He was outside the mainstream, and if there was an alternative to the Bloom view, it was clear from what he had been reported as having told the Mail on Sunday that he would be a good person to provide that counterblast. He did write for um, the bulletin, and the article he wrote was rather more cautious in tone and more informative than what Professor Bloom had had to say. Lawrence, it's PRSE 40411 at page 11. squidgy writing, but hopefully we can make it a bit larger. So this is his piece in the bulletin. And if you look on the right-hand column, he tells you really quite a lot. The pattern of the epidemic has suggested that AIDS may be due to an infectious agent transmitted by intimate contact so you've got a reference to sex there. Or blood product inoculation in a way reminiscent of hepatitis B virus. While there are many other suggested causes, this one currently seems the most likely. The agent's probably a virus. 
but it hasn't been identified, so no tests. A particular problem is that there appears to be quite a long period, months or years, between exposure to the causative agent and the person becoming ill, during which time he or she may be infectious. Then in the second paragraph, starting over 2,000 cases, about four lines down, the disease carries a high mortality. And then if you jump a bit further, five or so lines down, the syndrome is rightly being viewed with some concern. In the present state of knowledge, a major objective must be to try to reduce the risk of transmitting the disease further. How does this affect haemophiliacs? He says AIDS has affected one in a thousand in the USA and two patients in the UK. So you're getting that information. The immediate source of infection in such patients is thought to have been factor eight concentrate, derived as it is from thousands of donors. So you're getting the information about where it's coming from and the fact that this is large pool concentrate, very different to cryo. On the other hand, this new and to some extent theoretical hazard of using concentrates has to be set against the enormous benefits, especially for home therapy. As in any other medical setting, the risk has to be balanced against the dangers of the disease itself. Factor eight concentrate from the USA may be the most likely to contain the AIDS agent. However, the risk is probably small and no source can be regarded as completely free from risk. Furthermore, the USA is the only country capable of providing the quantity of factor eight currently needed by UK haemophiliacs. And then a few lines down, the present balance of opinion among haemophilia centre directors in the UK, therefore, is that imported factor eight concentrate should continue to be used for those selected patients already receiving it. And he sets out who those are. And then he sets out those who shouldn't get it. Children, those with mild disease. And he says the source of factor eight concentrates will need to be kept under constant review, as will blood donor policy, both by the medical profession and the relevant industrial concerns to minimise or eliminate the risk. Now, two points to make. One, all of that was good, sound advice with some facts, and the society would have done well to keep repeating it. Second, whatever it was that he did or did not say to the Mail on Sunday, by the time he was writing for the bulletin in the middle of 1983, Dr Pinchin was giving the same advice as Professor Bloom. Well, was he, or was he simply saying the present balance of opinion, balance of opinion, among haemophilia centre directors. He's not actually saying it's his opinion, is he? No, he's not. Um, and one may think that he chooses his words rather carefully. Um, the difficulty with the balance of opinion is that it wasn't a balance of opinion. It was the unanimous opinion. Um, but Well, uh, at, at the uh, uh, executive level, certainly. But he, he says what he says. And, yes. and he doesn't say... But he doesn't say what his view is, uh, and that has to be balanced when I come to look at this, and think about it, with what's reported in the Mail on Sunday. And for that matter, uh, I recall whether it was that or whether it was the, um, the, the Northern uh, Echo or, or another paper. Uh, he record, recorded the thing saying it was madness to take um, a blood product from a country in the middle of an epidemic. Yes. Which would suggest his view, at least at that time, um, and for the purposes of that report, if properly reported, uh, was that it shouldn't be admitted into the country. There we are. It, that, that, that's right. Um, and as I said, he, he's not a haematologist. I think he's an immunologist, so far as we know, not patient-facing. So he wasn't challenged with what to say to a patient um, and what to prescribe. Um, 
and the, the shortages that there were. But th the piece that he wrote is more nuanced uh, and much more helpful than anything that emanated from Professor Bloom. Looking abroad, the risk minimization measures unanimously adopted by the World Federation of Haemophilia in July 1983 were very similar to the UK HCDO's guidelines. Not a single doctor in the UK contacted the society to voice any disagreement with the information it published about AIDS between 1983 and 1985, and many haematologists have given evidence to the inquiry about the fact that they made the bulletin available to patients. The society's belief from 83 to 85 was that without US concentrates, there was not enough blood product in the UK to treat patients, and that if left untreated, patients with severe conditions would suffer bleeds which would certainly cause damage to joints. That was the context in which, in September 1983, the Society urged the government to continue to import from the US, which was something that the civil service had already decided to do in May 83 in any event. In essence, the treatment advice from centre directors, supported by the Department of Health and all parts of the NHS system, did not change until heat treated product was universally adopted in 1985. Perhaps the best evidence of how the society was thinking in this crucial period comes from John Prothero, who you heard um, at the end of that clip, and who, um, I remind you, died in October 1989, um, and other people with haemophilia in the July 1985 documentary Bad Blood. We're going to play um, some clips in a moment, and to set the scene, by the time this programme went out, we we're a decade on from the one we've just looked at, and the programme started by saying that five people with haemophilia had died of AIDS in the UK. It discussed the numbers of people estimated to be infected in the UK, and we see Dr Peter Jones saying that for those infected, there's a 90 to 95% chance that they're going to be all right and Dr. Savage saying that the risk of infecting a partner is about 5%. So we'll play some of those clips um, now, and they end with John Prothero. Thank you, Lawrence. Haemophilia is a rare complaint affecting men. There are 4,500 sufferers in Britain. All lack the vital clotting ingredient in their blood which prevents internal bleeding and crippling damage to their joints. John Prothero, aged 41, is a civil servant from London. You can know them out literally from one minute to the next if you're going to start a bleed in a, a knee, uh, an elbow, anywhere in your body. Uh, must have been 30 or 40% of, of schooling I just missed, uh, right through primary school and right up to you know, A levels at uh, grammar school. Uh, with no treatment around, every time you got a bleed, you'd be off work for a couple of weeks or so. Godfrey is a 41-year-old clock repairer from North Yorkshire. First of all, you lose a very slight amount of movement, and you get a little twinge of pain in that particular joint. Those are the early stages of, um, of a bleed. As the hours go by, the, the joint uh, movement is increasingly reduced. Um, it begins to start to get hot, extremely painful, and if it's a knee bleed, in a few hours, of course, you just cannot walk. And you're in, you're in agony from the pain of it. What actually happened with your hand? Um, that was due to a bleed in the forearm when I was about 12 years old. And uh, there was no form of treatment then, effective form of treatment. And so it just had to bleed in until the pressure stopped itself. And of course, it took months to subside. All the old, you know, the blood to subside away. And I was left with that. John Strutt is a 35-year-old local government officer from London. He's married with two children. Gardening is a particular problem that you have to give serious consideration to before you undertake digging or any form of physical exertion. In my experience, prolonged digging would um, necessitate at least one, maybe two, fairly difficult bleeds. Any social life was non-existent um, and job-wise would have been very 
difficult. Uh, you couldn't say that you would be at work, say, tomorrow or next week, because you probably wouldn't. You may have a bleed. I suppose the pre-treatment era is the best you described as um, a bit of a nightmare in many respects. Um, the constant episodes of bleeding, um, the severe pain lasting for anything from four to six weeks, and the prolonged periods of inactivity. I suppose if I, if I reached to be 20, 30, I would be very lucky. Uh, indeed, yes. With all the hazards that there were, um, you would be very lucky to reach that area. Another long-standing supporter of the use of imported Factor VIII is Dr. Geoffrey Savage of St. Thomas's Hospital in London. To remove treatment or to restrict treatment in these patients is to take away their independent lifestyle, their possibility of gaining employment and holding down employment, their possibilities of having a family, and of being able to offer a sensible contribution to society. Once the test for infection by the AIDS virus has proved positive, the worry for haemophiliacs is waiting to see if they will develop the killer disease. In Newcastle, for 71 out of 93 severe haemophiliacs, the test was positive. At St. Thomas's Hospital in London, it proved positive for 120 out of 150. As far as they themselves are concerned, it's a pretty shattering thing to have to live with. Because although, as a doctor, looking at the American evidence, I can assure them that 90, 95% chance is that they're going to be perfectly all right. The adults, at least, have got to make fundamental changes in the way that they live, uh, particularly with a view to their sexual lives, um, because of, of this marker in their bloodstreams. So it's not a very nice thing to have to tell patients and their families. Just how real is the risk of transmitting AIDS has been highlighted by the case of American Patrick Burke. He contracted AIDS from using contaminated factor VIII. Before this was diagnosed, he transmitted the AIDS virus to his wife, who now has symptoms of the disease. She, in turn, passed on the virus to their son, born last year. The boy has now developed AIDS. What exactly is the risk that, in fact, someone who has the AIDS virus could transmit it to their wife or girlfriend or to a child? The figures among haemophilics are, are very scanty, um, but generally speaking, I think from American data, one is thinking in terms of about 5% transmission rate to sexual partners. So it's obviously a very real risk. It is a risk. The first evidence of that risk in Britain was confirmed this weekend. The wife of a Newcastle haemophiliac has contracted AIDS. Haemophiliacs who have been infected by the virus have now come to terms with the risk of AIDS. But for them, when it comes to factor eight, the choice has always been an unenviable one. I think the choice is between not using it and having the certainty of, of pain, discomfort, eventually uh, losing one's job perhaps, um, being a burden on your family. Against that, you have to weigh the very slight risk of AIDS. Uh, and with it, leading a normal life. To me, there is no choice. I wouldn't want to go back to the pre-factor eight days. It's a gamble. You may be one of the unfortunate ones. Um, in anything, th there's a small percentage risk, you know, that we're going to lose one or two. Well, that's, that's, that's fair enough. I can come to terms with that. My, my quality of life is such that um, I've no wish to lower it. I suppose you, AIDS, of course, is such a dramatic new development that you, you inevitably you're going to think, well, it doesn't take too long before you realise it's a, it's a small risk, okay? It's another risk on top of the hepatitis risk and all the other sort of risks. But the certainty that, that I, I know what would happen to myself, to my body, if I didn't take the, the treatment material, that, there's no speculation about that. That's not even a risk, that's a certainty. There may be some core participants who have a feeling that the society should have done more to campaign on behalf of people 
um, who were infected with HIV in the later 1980s, I don't know. For, for those who do have that feeling, I would strongly recommend that they read the statement of um, Sharon Lewis, Mr. Prothero's widow. It, it talks movingly about his decision to do as much media work as he could between 1985 um, and when he died in 1989. He, he felt that it was incumbent on him to be open about his infection to combat the stigma of AIDS and to explain the predicament of, of people who shared his situation and he worked hard to achieve acceptance by the government of its moral responsibility towards people infected by contaminated blood and he fought for justice and financial redress for them in the few years left to him between speaking to you then and his death. That, that, that's oh, plainly a convenient moment. So we'll take a break, uh, and we'll come back at quarter to 12. So quarter to 12. <laughs>